Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, indeed, it is late August and Labor Day is right around the corner. And you know what that means. It means to be, I just got a glare from over here in the congregation. It means the start of school is right around the corner. It's kind of, it's kind of the thing that cannot be spoken about, like Voldemort, that name from Harry Potter. School cannot be spoken. Teachers, and we have some of them in our congregation, teachers are already in full swing, about to be in full swing, getting their classrooms ready, putting up posters in their room, putting up bulletin boards with happy, bright colors, especially in elementary school. And one thing you might, or not might, you're very likely to find in most elementary school rooms are a list of class rules, especially um, in those lower grades, like K through three, class lists of a class, class rules right at the beginning, uh, right at the front of the front of the room. And these are rules that help little ones to learn classroom behavior, what, how everyone needs to function in order for a classroom to function properly. Now, every teacher makes their own set of rules. That's one of the good things about being a teacher. You can state your own rules. Um, but I think there are some common denominators, find, ones you find in almost every classroom. I just looked online to get a, a sampling of them. And this was one I found that I thought was pretty good general rules. I'll list them for you here. Number one, be kind. Number two, listen to your teachers. Number three, keep your desk tidy. That's one I still need to learn. Number four, show up on time. Number five, share with others. Six, try your best. Seven, raise your hand. And eight, respect your classmates. I think those are, that's a really good list, isn't it? That's a good list. So we might call them classroom rules. But a lot of them are kind of well-worn sayings or wisdom, just plain wisdom, not even so much rules on what behavior you should have in a classroom. And I don't know if you thought about this. When I read that list, I thought to myself that list of classroom rules could be posted in a lot of places where grown-ups mostly are, <laughs> right? Boardrooms, legislatures, <laughs> those, those rules just don't have uh, they just don't have a place in a classroom. They have a, a places in throughout our world, I think, how different our discourse as grown-ups would be in those contexts if we if we followed a rule like be kind or think about think about the other people in your class. In any case, that's just an aside. Back to the classroom rules. These func these words and rules function as words to learn by right? Words to learn by in a classroom. And today in our readings, I hope you get this sense, just hearing to this opening here, that's what we have going on in our readings today. They are words on what holy living is, what kingdom, what kingdom of God behavior is. And Jesus takes an opportunity. He's at a dinner party. They had him in the first century too, a dinner party on the Sabbath at a Pharisee's house. And he takes the opportunity at that supper to look around and give some teachings based on what he observes right then and there at the supper table. So the, he gives two teachings. And the first teaching comes after he watches guests clamor and jockey for a good seat at the table. And the second te teaching comes observing the host. And it's a lesson for the host. So we might call these words to dine by, if those first classroom lists were words to learn by. These are words to dine by, but really they have wider application as a member of the kingdom of God. So let's look at that first teaching, the one with the clamoring guests. If you're someone who likes to picture in your head what a scripture passage might look like in a movie, I think this is a fun one. I know we've got actors among us, people who might block scenes in their block scenes in their head, and I like this one. You got Jesus sitting back on at a on a on a chair, just watching watching the view, and what he sees is upstanding people trying to get the positions of honor at the table. Now. I'm pretty sure we've all witnessed this. This happens now in our time too. Either at, you're at a dinner, maybe for work, 
um, or at your friend's house for a celebration. This happens at a wedding where the assigned places are and you look to see, well, who gets to sit closest to the main table, you know, the main event. And so you're aware and you feel, maybe you feel the pressure yourself to be in close proximity to the host. That's what's going on here. That's what Jesus is observing. Who gets a place of honor? And Jesus right then and there, after watching this, offers some good advice. And the good advice is pretty simple. Don't take a seat of honor because it's going to be embarrassing for you if you have to be moved. That's the raw piece. If you look at text again, that's the raw piece of advice Jesus gives. That's actually super good advice. That's good advice. But this good advice functions here in our text for Jesus as an illustration. It's good advice, yes, but it also functions as an illustration. And we know this because in verse 11, in verse 11, Jesus says this, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's a reversal. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, somewhere deep in your brains, this might have rung a bell for you. In Luke, the beginning of Luke, we hear about reversals from Mary, from Jesus' mom, Mary. When she learns that she's going to give birth to the Son of God, she gives this beautiful song of praise that we call the Magnificat. And in this Magnificat, she foretells what Jesus has come to do. Jesus has come to remove the powerful from their seats, from their seats from their thrones. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. And Jesus will throughout Luke be all about this kind of reversal that happens. Chapters later in his ministry, Jesus welcomes the little children, like one of our own little ones here in our congregation, and says, Who, well, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes the one who has sent me. From the least among you will be the greatest. Reversal, the least is the greatest. So there's Jesus at the dinner table and he issues this good advice that's sage old wisdom. And he sees that this is really an illustration of something is larger. The greatest will become the least and the least will become the greatest. And what's that function? It's humility. What functions there is humility. Humility is the hallmark of being in the kingdom of God. Value is placed on being humble, not powerful. That's reversal. In the world's eyes, the powerful have glory and the greatest seat at the table, right? But in the kingdom, it's the lowly, it's the humbled, and it's those who humble themselves to lift them up. For Jesus, taking a lower seat at the table at a dinner party is an illustration of the kind of grand reversal his kingdom is at work doing. It's the kind of king, that's what kingdom living means. Humble yourself and humble yourself to help the lowly for its humble service and humble love of neighbor that we find glory. And Christ, of course, is our greatest example of this. For his humble service led to death on a cross a service only he could give and he could do. This kind of humility, this kind of humbling ourselves to be God's love in the world can take so many forms, everyday sort of forms. Just to stick with the idea of dining, let's just start there. It can, it can range from sitting with a person at a dinner party who knows no one instead of sitting with friends with whom conversation would be really easy. So it can start there, but it can also mean preparing a serving a meal on Thanksgiving to those in need. Humble love sees people on the same level as all loved children of God, on the same level, not sort of social ladder level. This kind of humility can be hard to live out. It can mean reaching out to someone at work who's not well liked for some reason, staying after hours to listen to someone talk who's going through a really hard time giving more places to giving to more places who offer help to those on the fringes of society to show humble love toward neighbor that is where glory lies 
If humility is the point and reversal is the point of Jesus' first teaching about those clamoring guests, then compassion is the point of Jesus' second teaching, this teaching to the host. So Jesus looks around at the party and he calls out, he looks at the fact that people on the same social status are all there, other lawyers and Pharisees. And he, that's a common practice then, it's a common practice now. And he looks and sees, well, this must be somewhat due to the social more of, if I invite you to my party, you'll invite me to your party. That still exists now today for sure. Or I invite you to my party and I can expect you to support me in some way. In other words, Jesus calls out the first century notion of if I scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's definitely still in play today in our culture. It's alive and well. The idea that you're motivated to do something for someone so that they become indebted to you to do something for you in the future. It's a contract. It's a contractual notion. I do this, you do that for me. Well, that's not kingdom of God sort of living. <laughs> Jesus reminds us. And to make the point, he tells the host to invite people to dinner who had nothing, who could give nothing to repay. The lowly, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Again, those people Mary spoke about in the Magnificat. So I don't know if you guys have listened to StoryCorps. It's a, a, a regular, um, like, well, story, I guess, a regular uh, piece on NPR where they tell stories from gathered from around the country. And they're actually recorded. And they, I think they're recorded at the Library of Congress. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's true. Um, StoryCorps. And I, and I heard one a while back and it's a conversation between two men in san francisco and one of these men they lived in a low income housing uh, housing uh, building and one of the men decided to serve meals to his fellow neighbors meals elderly to elderly people and people who were sick people who could not go out and get meals on their own and so it was a conversation between these two men and the the man's name, Herman, Herman is the one who went around on sell, uh, coming every week with a meal for people who could not make it out of their, make it out of their apartments. And Ronald, or Robert, I'm sorry, Robert was one of the men he delivered groceries to. And Robert, the man who received the groceries, he said this to Herman. He says, sometimes I sit back and watch you, and I've seen the way you handle yourself with the residents. They know they're treated with respect when they see you coming. And there are other people in other complexes that have been trying to steal Herman for years to have him come and deliver their food because of the way you act. You know, it's the little things that you do day in and day out that I admired for the last eight years, Robert said. I don't think you can find a better person to be friends with. I thought that was just such a beautiful easy you know there's no there's no sort of grand grandness it's just these two men talking about this simple act of kindness that this man herman had he saw a need right there in his community of people who couldn't get out of their apartments and so he came around every week with groceries and food and meat, things for them to make meals that's kingdom of god sort of living that's compassion sort of living when you do something not because you're going to get something in return but because it's the right thing to do and it's the thing that Jesus would do. So there we have it. We have words to dine by. That words are really words to live by. Be humble, show compassion. That's kingdom behavior. And we have this kind of behavior because we follow the one who did it for us. These beautiful words from Philippians came to my mind. Beautiful words that used to, scholars think they were probably a hymn or some sort of creed from Philippians. Jesus, the one who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And God exalted him and gave him the name above every name. Well, that's the kind of life. That's the kind of kingdom life that Jesus opens for us. And by God's grace, may we live it together. In his name, amen.